Catholic Answers senior apologist Jimmy Aiken is a veteran Catholic apologist. He's done this for nearly 30 years at Catholic Answers. He has answered bajillion questions on different aspects of the Catholic faith, and he himself began as a convert. This episode of the show, this week on the show, I am joined by the aforementioned Jimmy Aiken to unpack his conversion story. It's marked by tragedy, but by the distinct undercurrent of God's grace and providence. And look, I think about my own journey, people like Jimmy who impacted me and my my conversion to the Catholic faith, and I think the amazing ability to see God's hand at work in his life, moving him towards the, the role that he is in now, and how him saying yes to those things along the way, submitting to God's will along the way, finding truth where it lay along the way, led to him in the role he is now that could impact people like us, like me, like you, people that he has impacted with his knowledge of the Catholic faith and his ability to channel God's grace and that providence and 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 the Holy Spirit to help explain the faith so well. It's a fantastic conversation, includes some great uh, evidence, some great um, ideas around the papacy, around Sola Scriptura, these things that drew him into the church. He'll explain why and, and how that happened. And really, a guy who's been doing this for 30 years, you want to hear what he has to say about these kind of things, the, some of the best arguments that you'll hear for many of these topics. So please do listen. Please uh, subscribe to this channel if you can, if you watch this video, and, and, and give me a thumbs up as well. Hit the bell. All those things you do on YouTube, please do them to help this channel to continue to grow. And enjoy this conversation with Jimmy Aiken, Catholic Answers Senior Apologist. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. A fantastic conversation uh, for you this week. I am joined by Jimmy Aiken. Jimmy is a senior apologist at Catholic Answers, a regular guest on Catholic Answers Live. He's a highly sought after speaker, debater, the host of one of my favorite podcasts, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on SQPN, available on podcasts everywhere. And the author of some fantastic books, including Fathers Know Best, Teaching with Authority, and The Bible is a Catholic Book. Jimmy, thank you for being here. Welcome back to the show, uh, and hello. Hey, it's my pleasure, and also hello. <laughs> I should say, too, one thing I didn't mention in your intro that is, is important for our conversation today is that you are a Catholic convert. You are a convert to the Catholic faith, <laughs> and you went on from, from there uh, as a convert to now become an apologist for a very long time at Catholic Answers, very well respected, very well versed in, in the Catholic world. So what I want to do for listeners and viewers today is to dig into your conversion story, because it's a fascinating one, um, and then kind of unpack some of those things that, that first convinced you of the truth of Catholicism, and then look in, in retrospect on, on how you've been refined or, or, or not changed, but dug deeper in those positions as you've learned more and as you've had to explain the faith to others these last number of decades. So I think it'll be a lot of fun for listeners and viewers uh -huh. to get into. So I want to get a bit out of the way at the beginning, and I want, if you can, to unpack your, your journey of of faith. I know you didn't begin Catholic. You didn't even begin, I don't think necessarily, well, you did, I think, begin Christian. I know you had a little side tour into, into the New Age world, but I'll get out of the way and let, and let you tell your story rather than I tell it for you. Sure. So some folks may not be aware that I'm a convert. Um, there are, or may not have previously been aware, because I don't really talk about it a whole lot. Uh, there are some converts who really kind of make the fact they're a convert prominent in uh, in how they present themselves to the public. And I tend not to do that because I don't particularly want to be a convert. You know, I want to be a Catholic. And now I've been actually been a Catholic for most of my life, more than 50% yeah. now. So um, I'm, I'm not a total newbie when it comes to this. And I've really tried to assimilate Catholic thought and Catholic identity um, so I don't make a big deal out of it, but it is part of my journey and I'm happy to talk about it. So to give you a little bit of background, so I was born in Texas and I was raised in Arkansas. And in that part of the country, 
at least when I was growing up and still today, there was a, um, it, well, number one, it's a very Protestant part of the country. And it was even more so when I was growing up. Today, as a result of immigration and migration within America, there has been an increased Catholic presence in the South. But when I was growing up, Arkansas was like two or three percent Catholic or something like that. And I barely knew any Catholics. One of the denominations that was prominent in the area is a denomination known as the Church of Christ. And this group grew out of the 19th century revivalism movement here in America in the Second Great Awakening. Um, it's sometimes called the Stone Campbell movement after a couple of early leaders. And it, it's a fundamentalist church in the sense that its members would say, yes, I'm a fundamentalist. They, it, they tend to be very serious about their faith, very serious about a very little literal interpretation of the Bible. Um, they have some distinctives uh, like not using instruments in worship, because even though there are all kinds of instruments in the Old Testament that are used in worship, and even though we see instruments being used in Revelation in worship, there are no passages in the New Testament that explicitly say you should use instruments in Christian worship. And they say, well, no passages authorizing us to use them, therefore we shouldn't, which is a rather restrictive application of Sola Scriptura that most Protestants wouldn't go along with. But you see how they can be very firm about their positions. Well, my uh, parents were both members of the Church of Christ, and so they uh, took me to the Church of Christ till I was about six or seven years old. And I didn't particularly enjoy it because... Church of Christ services, I mean, there is some praying, there is some singing, but it's basically a big sermon. And so, for, and, and, of, and in the time and place, people would get dressed up, so I would be a little kid. It was a Sunday, I was made to wear this itchy suit to go and then listen to a guy yell for an hour <laughs> and just have to sit in a pew and not do anything fun. And so I didn't particularly enjoy going. And I always felt hot because of the suit. I thought it's called Sunday because the sun is hotter on that day. <laughs> At least that was my childhood interpretation of this. Um, in any event, uh, I, 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 in any event uh, when I was about six or seven, my parents had some disagreement with the elders of the local congregation, and we basically stopped going to church. So after that, I was raised basically nominally Protestant. We would go to church once or twice a year, uh, typically when we were visiting my grandparents down in Texas. Uh, we'd go to church with them, but otherwise we really didn't. When I was in my teenage years, as you mentioned, I had a flirtation with the New Age movement, and so I explored a bunch of New Age thought. And then when I was around in my late teens, I kind of broke with the New Age movement and was sort of a not an agnostic because I always believed in God, but I didn't believe that anybody knew much about God. So I was kind of an agnostic deist. Um, and then when I was 20, I started, uh, I was working a job. I was, um, I was a dishwasher at a restaurant. And so I would work uh, long hours into the night and then I'd get home, you know, around midnight and I was not ready to go to bed because I had been physically active for the previous six hours. And, and so I was still revved up and I needed something to do to unwind. And this was early cable days. This was before the internet. And so there was a limited selection of late night viewing that was available on the basic cable channels. And, and it turned out there was this guy, uh, he was a televangelist named Gene Scott, who was on late night television when I would come home. And he was bizarre. He was just totally bizarre. He was unlike any televangelist I'd ever seen. He was not like Jimmy Swaggart. He was not like Jerry Falwell. He was not like Jim Baker. He was not like Robert Tilton. He was not like any of the others. He, uh, number one, he, he had a bit of a beard, uh, not as long as mine, but he had a beard. And he would wear crazy hats. Uh, I mean, they weren't all crazy, but sometimes they were, but he would wear hats. He would smoke cigars and pipes and wear a leather jacket and cuss on the air. 
And needless to say, that was a bit of resting, uh, you know, to see from a televangelist. And he was so unlike any other televangelist I'd ever seen that it got my attention long enough to listen to him talk about God and about Jesus. And so, you know, he's one of the only things on at, at night when I get home from work. And so I started watching him. And eventually I said, you know, I maybe I should read the Gospels, you know, because I'd never read them. I'd read other parts of the Bible because I was growing up in the 1970s. And, you know, the idea that we were just on the verge of Armageddon was a really big thing. You know, the late great planet Earth by Hal Lindsey was a best-selling book and a best uh, blockbuster movie in the 1970s. And it was selling the idea that the 1980s were going to be the decade of Armageddon and the second coming was going to happen. And so with all of that and Cold War fear in the air, I had as a kid, been interested in Bible prophecy. And I read some books on Bible prophecy, and I read passages in the Bible that were prophetic. And of course, I would look back and say, I, I did not interpret them correctly. Um, but uh, I had never read the Gospels. You know, I'd, I'd had Bible stories about Jesus and all the ones from Genesis that you hear as a kid and everything. Um, but I'd never read the Gospels. And I thought, well, maybe I should read the Gospels. And a friend of mine warned me, you know, you could end up becoming a Christian. And, and I said, oh, that's not going to happen. And my friend was like, no, no, no. Actually, so like C.S. Lewis, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia guy, he was an intelligent guy. He started reading this and taking it seriously, and he ended up becoming a Christian. And I didn't think that would happen to me, but it did. <laughs> and so I initially was very um, tentative about all of this Christian stuff, because, uh, you know, I didn't have a dramatic suddenly seeing the light conversion moment. Uh, instead, as I read the Gospels, I, I, I started to think, okay, there's something to this Christianity business. It's got at least a little something that other religions maybe don't. And so I should take it seriously. I should become a Christian, but I was still very tentative in my faith. I did not immediately say, oh, I believe the Bible and everything it says and, and so forth. Um, but as I continued to study, I gained more and more confidence in the Bible, and I began to take it more and more seriously as the Word of God. And I reached a point where I said, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to study and teach God's Word. That's what I want to do. And I wanted to become a Protestant seminary professor, uh, maybe also a Protestant pastor, but, um, but I really wanted to devote myself and my career to this. And that, of course, left the question of, well, in what venue am I going to do that, you know, denominationally speaking? And so... I recognize that, you know, okay, in my town here in Arkansas, in the Ozark Mountains, there are dozens of churches. And which one should I affiliate with? Well, I recognize that which church is in easy driving distance is not a good test for theological <laughs> truth. Neither is which one has music that I like, or which one has preaching that I like, or which one has social clubs that I like. I'm interested in the truth. I mean, if it's if it's in easy driving distance and it's got nice music and nice preaching and nice social clubs, great. But that's not why I should be going there. I should be going there because it's it's teaching the truth because that's what I want to hear. I want to learn the truth. And so I made a point of studying uh, the the theology of all the different branches of Christianity. I I would read deliberately, read books from different perspectives. I'd read books written by Lutherans. I'd read books written by Methodists. I'd read books written by Orthodox. I'd read books written by Catholics, Baptists, Presbyterians, everybody, and, uh, and, and other groups as well. And because I didn't want to just reflexively fall into a particular viewpoint. Um, now, as I did this, I was also reading the Bible, or at least and I wanted to read the Bible all the way through, 
And I did, to the best of my understanding at the time. Later, I found out that wasn't true because, oh, they're the Deuterocanonicals. Um, but uh, so I felt a little cheated. It's like, wait, I wanted to do it all at once. What it, in any event? I, I then, of course, later did read the Deuterocanonicals. Uh, and I do a lot of Bible reading in general. But as I read through the Bible, and as I read through these other books, I found certain passages in the Bible that just sounded Catholic, you know, um, like you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, baptism now saves you, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven, whoever sins you retain, they are retained. I mean, that sounds like the 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 Pope baptismal regeneration and the sacrament of confession. Oh, and of course, you know, this is my body and, you know, the Eucharist, things, the real presence, things like that. Well, you know, uh, I was recognizing that these verses at least sound Catholic. They, that didn't mean they taught Catholic teaching, but they at least sound Catholic. And I need to give, I need to give that due consideration. But I also recognize my own limitations. Uh, you know, I'm a baby Christian at this point, or at least that's the terminology that, you know, was common in my community. I'm a recent convert. And I don't know a whole lot. I'm still assimilating stuff. I'm still learning. So I said, what I'll do is I'll take these verses, I'll kind of put them on a shelf, and I'll come back to them later when I know more and I'm in a better position to evaluate evaluate what they really mean. And so um, I proceeded to uh, continue my studies. I went to a number of different types of churches, ended up uh, going to a uh Calvinist church, a uh, conservative one. It's in a denomination called the Presbyterian Church in America, which is a conservative Presbyterian denomination. And I was, uh, I made my desire to pursue the ministry known there. And Presbyterian churches are governed by a body of elders. That's why they're called Presbyterians, because the Greek word pres presbyteros or presbyter means elder. So they don't have bishops, they have elders. And each church has a body of elders known as the session that run the local congregation. And so as someone who was interested in pursuing the ministry, I was under care of session, which meant that the elders of the church had taken an interest in, you know, helping me discern whether this is something I should go into and, and things like that. And I was planning, I was studying philosophy at the time academically, and so my academic training is actually in anal analytic philosophy, which is a type of philosophy that's very careful in studying words and propositions and logical structures and, and things like that. And um, it's kind of like 21st century Thomas Aquinas type stuff. And I was, uh, you know, preparing to go. I was looking around for a seminary to attend once I got my philosophy degree, and I actually visited a Reformed Theological Seminary in St. Louis and was checking out some other ones. At the same time, you know, as a young man, I'm starting to look at building a, a, a life outside of academia and outside of my career, and so I was dating, and I ended up marrying a woman named Renee, uh, who had a very interesting background. She was raised in a UFO religion. Um, there are a variety of UFO religions that are very small, that are around. Uh, the biggest and most famous one today probably is the Raelians. Um, but she, her family was not part of the Raelian church. Uh, it was a very, very small local thing that was based in southern Missouri. And uh, her mom had joined it when she was a kid and, of course, took the kids along. Um, and Renee had quit that. So she had, she had she'd left the UFO religion, but she had fallen back on her family's historic Catholicism. And there was no way that I was going to be pursuing a career as a Protestant seminary professor and or pastor with a wife who was Catholic. Yeah. Not in not in conservative evangelicalism. Uh, not only would I not have been accepted in that role, but I also took seriously the passages in the pastoral epistles where St. Paul says that 
ministers of the gospel need to have religious solidarity with their families. And so if, if I don't, uh, then I wouldn't be qualified in my own eyes to serve in this role. So I talked to Renee about all of this and through various arguments, I convinced and other things, I basically convinced her to stop identifying as a Catholic. She started identifying as an Anglican. And well, okay, that's at least Protestant. Ultimately, if I'm going to be a pastor, I need my wife in the same denomination as me. But I looked on Anglicanism as a kind of stepping stone in that direction, and we got married. And then once we were married, the pressure of losing me was off. She immediately went back to Catholicism, (laughs) which had the effect of wrecking my career. (laughs) <laughs> and this was the only thing I wanted to do with my life. And it was very painful. Um, but I took my marriage vows seriously and said, okay, well, this is these are the facts on the ground. I need to do my best to follow God in this venue and under these circumstances. And so I uh, began preparing for a different career. And I thought about, uh, I'd had a professor uh, come to me I'd been taking a um, political science class from um, from a woman named Diane Blair, who, although I didn't know it at the time, she was like Hillary Clinton's best friend. Oh. Because I was going to um, I was going to the University of Arkansas Fayetteville, which is where Bill and Hillary Clinton taught for a while. That was before my time. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I took this class from Diane Blair. She was a very sharp woman. And, um, and I really enjoyed her class. And she came to me outside of class at one point and said, have you ever thought about going to law school? And I said, well, no, not really. And she says, well, I, you know, do in political science, I have lots of students who want to go to law school because it's a way of, you know, getting a background that's suited for becoming a politician. And so she said, I see lots of students who want to go to law school, and a lot of them don't have the ability to be a good lawyer. And based on the way you think, you do. So you should seriously consider going to law school. And so I, I, uh, I said, I, I said, well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll think about it. And I didn't for a while. But then once I had to find a new career, I did think about it because I'd started reading some books on the law just for my own information. You know, I'd read books about Supreme Court law and uh, the history of, of constitutional law and things like that. And I just found it fascinating. And so I, uh, I, I ended up taking the LSAT, the Legal Skills Aptitude Test, And I scored very well on it. I was like in the 90th percentile. Um, But I decided if I couldn't be a Supreme Court justice, maybe I should just go back to philosophy and become a (laughs) philosophy professor. And being a philosophy professor is kind of the next best thing to being a theology professor. So I I went back to uh, grad school in philosophy and started working on a master's degree. And the the plan was to... um, to become, uh, to get a PhD and, and go into philosophy. And I, um, I was doing really well in grad school and one, but I kept up my religious studies because I'm serious in my Christian faith. I still want to learn more about God's word and, and everything. So one day I was reading a book that had an extended quotation from Matthew 16 in it. Matthew 16 is the famous, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church passage. And up to that point, I had said, Peter is not the rock. Uh, I was an advocate of the view that P- that Jesus is actually contrasting Peter with the rock. You know, the you are a small stone, Peter, but on this great big rock, I'm going to build my church. So there's a contrast there. At least that's what I would argue. And specifically, I would have argued that what the rock is, is the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. And I thought I could support that from the context. But as I was reading this extended quotation, I noticed there are structural features here in the text of Matthew, and they are so obvious. They're even there in the English. You don't have to go to the Greek. They're right there in the English, and they demand that Peter's the rock. And as soon as I saw those structures, I, uh, that was all I needed to see. I pivoted on that question, and I said, okay, Peter's the rock. 
And that means that when Jesus ascends to heaven, Peter's in charge of the earthly church. And being in charge of the earthly church is a basic description of the office of the Pope. So Catholics are right to describe Peter as the first Pope. Now, whether there were meant to be later Popes or whether Peter was kind of a one-off is a separate question. And I would still need to investigate that. But I said to myself, if Catholics are right about that, then I need to do a review of all of the categories of systematic theology with an open mind towards the Catholic position. And so I, even though I was in grad school, I took about a year and, you know, I'm, I'm doing fine in the classes. Those are no problem. But what I'm really doing is pouring all of my time into studying this question. And I worked my way through uh, the different areas of systematic theology and with an open mind to the Catholic position. And I became progressively more convinced uh, of aspects of the Catholic faith. I reached a certain point where I needed some help because this was the night this was the early 1990s this was before the internet so you could not go online and look stuff up this was before the catechism of the catholic church so you could not just look up what is the official church teaching on this topically um i was doing the best i could with a parish library that i was skulking around in the local parish that had a mix of accurate, you know, theologically accurate books and junk that had been written by Hans Kung and people like that. And so what I needed was, and I recognized that, okay, not all of this is really speaking for what the church teaches. Some of this is just junk. And I, I recognized that I needed, um, I, I needed to be able to ask some questions of a person who was a theologically orthodox Catholic who was biblically knowledgeable. And so I called a friend of mine uh, out in uh, Costa Mesa, California, who I'd met. He was the brother-in-law of one of the uh, elders of my Presbyterian church. And he was personally Lutheran, but he was an apologist and he was Catholic friendly. And I said, his name was Bob Passantino. And he and his wife, Gretchen, uh, operated a, an apologetics ministry called Answers in Action. And so I, I called Bob and I said, here's my situation. I need to find someone I can ask these questions of. And he said, well, why don't you contact Catholic Answers? And so I did. And I had this massive list of questions that we ultimately worked through. And as we did that, well, okay, there were a, sort of a couple things happening. Now, I got about six months into this year-long study project of the Catholic faith. And I had already seen which way the evidence was heading and that I was, I'm going to become Catholic. I'd, I'd, I still had some issues I wanted to resolve, but basically I knew I'm going to become Catholic because that's just what the evidence supports. And at that point, I realized if I become Catholic, I could get my career back because I could devote my life to teaching God's word in a Catholic context. And, and I was so thankful that God blinded me to that fact until I'd already made the decision to become Catholic, because that the fact I had not seen that, you know, and in hindsight, it's like, how could I miss that fact? But I'm so grateful I did because I knew I was converting to the Catholic faith because that's what I was convinced the evidence supported, not because I was tempted to get the kind of career I wanted. Yeah. And so, um, so what I also realized uh, was that because I had an education in, I mean, it was self-taught, but I'm an autodidact, so that goes with the territory. Um, I had given myself a background in in a wide range of Protestant theological positions and the arguments for them and so forth. And what I was doing now was going back through all of those categories and con convincing myself that the Catholic position was superior. And in essence, I was giving myself a background in Catholic apologetics. And 
as the people at Catholic Answers who were there at the time, um, and they've they've all, they've all moved on in various ways. I'm I'm actually the longest serving employee at Catholic Answers right now. I've been here for 28 years in just in like 12 days. It'll be 28 years. <laughs> um, in any event, uh, they saw potential in me as an apologist because I was essentially gaining a background in apologetics and they saw the way I thought and the way I processed information. And we thought, well, maybe after you come into the church, uh, you could see if there's a way to work together. Well, that wasn't likely um, because my wife was very wedded, not just to me, but to where we lived. She had a social, a familial social support network in Northwest Arkansas. She did not want to move. And, and, and so it didn't look like, you know, I would end up being a Catholic Answers apologist. And, and, you know, and that was fine. I could, you know, I'd, I'd already reconciled myself to doing whatever, you know, God wanted me to, given the circumstances that were in my life. And so I had peace with that. And, you know, I would just, in my mind, I'd probably just continue on and become a philosophy professor and take a job at a school in Arkansas and everything would be fine. Um, Providence has strange ways because one uh, night shortly before, my, my, my wife and I were born a couple of months apart. And we were both coming up on our uh, 27th birthdays. And one night, um, f- a couple of weeks before her birthday, my wife had a pain in her stomach. And she had always had frail health. Uh, she had a condition called ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory disease that can flare up and cause great pain for the person who suffers it, especially if they don't get themselves treated. And she had a phobia of doctors and had not been treated effectively in years. And um, so when she had this pain, we thought that it was a flare up of ulcerative colitis. And so we, you know, responded accordingly, doing the things that we knew to do to try to help with that situation. And it didn't improve. And Um, we were having, uh, one of the things that could help given was actually some massage and we had a massage therapist over the house to, you know, give her a massage, try to get her to relax and release some of the tension. And the massage therapist found a lump under her collarbone and we had to get that checked out. And when we did, and, and I thought, oh no, this could be cancer. We could be dealing with two things here. We could be dealing with uh, both an ulcerative colitis flare-up and cancer, and we don't need that. Um, well, we had it checked out. Turned out it was not two things. It was only one thing. It was cancer. It was uh, colon cancer, and it was very aggressive. Uh, the doctor who treated her, the uh, oncologist, told me that this form was so aggressive that he thought, even though many people live with cancer for years and years and years, um, he thought that she had probably had it for six, for three months, maybe for six months, probably not for nine months or a year, that it just started and then started tearing through her body. And she ended up um, dying of colon cancer just over two months after that first pain. And I was received into the Catholic Church in her hospital room using the emergency shortened form of the rites just four days before she died. Uh And we received communion together for the first and last time when I was received. And then she passed on. It was a obviously very difficult time for me, but it was also a time of grace because I saw the hand of providence in all this. And I knew that, that, you know, she had been reconciled with the people she needed to be reconciled with. Actually, um, there was a, a miraculous circumstance that occurred in that regard because when her mom 
uh, had her mom had a very strong will and her mom had l taken the kids, left her dad and like joined this UFO commune. And, uh, Renee had not seen her father in 20 years and he didn't live in the area. And shortly, and she had some resentment for him, um, based on, you know, him not having been there when she was growing up and, you know, I'm sure things that she'd been told about him. Um, but, uh, as it became clear that, uh, that she, this was a serious health crisis and she was going to die. I mean, she, I said, you know, shouldn't we contact your dad? And she asked, do you think we should? And I said, well, I think he would want to know. And so we were able to get his phone number and I, uh, I called and he wasn't there and we left a message and it turned and he did not live in the local area. He did not live in our state. Um, but by a miraculous providential coincidence, he was in Arkansas at the time and someone he had taken care of his house, heard the message, called him in Arkansas and he was able to come up on the bus within just a couple of days. Oh. And, um, and, and that was an amazing providential coincidence. I mean, if he hadn't been here, if he hadn't had someone checking the house, if that person hadn't had the message or hadn't heard the message and hadn't called him, she would never have seen her father before she died. And, um, I also told him the, uh, the way to get on her good side, which was to bring her a teddy bear because <laughs> she loved teddy bears. In fact, I still have her teddy bear collection. I've saved it all these years and I still know their personalities and the names she gave them. <laughs> um, so if you see me on Catholic answers live or something, that's why the stuffed animal collection is theirs. That's Renee's. Um, in any event, uh, they, I, I drove them to the hospital and uh, I left and let them have a long heart-to-heart -heart talk, and their relationship was healed after that. And so, um, and, and there were other miraculous things that happened that were signs to me. I mean, they weren't breaking the law of nature, laws of nature miraculous, but they were providential coincidence miraculous things that gave me a great deal of assurance regarding Renee's salvation. And, um, so after that, I finished out, uh, teaching the year, uh, as a, as a, a theology grad or as a philosophy grad student. And they actually, they were giving me a teaching award. I were, won several awards, uh, in, in, uh, philosophy when I was in school. And I had kind of a flip side of that conversation with Diane Blair. There was the, the, had one of the uh, my key professors who uh, for a time was head of the philosophy department a guy named tom senior um who is a christian philosopher um I, I remember sitting with him as they were giving me this teaching award um he said because the plan was i want to go out to california and work for catholic answers and be an apologist and he said it's really hard to get a a professorship in philosophy because of how competitive it is but you could do that and you could serve God in philosophy. And I said, thank you very much. I'm very flattered. This time I went out to California and became an apologist for Catholic Answers. And I've been here ever since. So that's the basic story. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic story to me. And it's very dramatic. It's full, it's full of interesting things. And I, gosh, maybe go back a little bit. To, mm -hmm. cause I'm curious for you. I mean, for me, I I was a convert out of a nominally Christian home. I actually had a bit of a, a week or so in the New Age movement. A short uh -huh. time. Uh -huh. I didn't go any deeper because for me also was was prior to Google, and I couldn't find out any more information about these New Age practices I'd heard about because there mm. wasn't Google just to Google, right? I'd I'd try and search the internet in those rudimentary days, and I couldn't find any more. So I, I stopped being New Age after a week and a half of that experiment, mm. and. I became Christian, found a Bible, read kind of similar to you, but my, my way of finding a church was basically just to join the church that I, I had some friends that were a part of. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder for you, looking at all these different denominations and doing kind of a deep dive into the different theologies and, and beliefs of the different denominations, 
did you ever at that early stage when you began investigating that wonder why there were so many denominations? Was that ever something that you were kind of a bit taken aback by at first? Not, not really, because growing up in the South, I was just exposed to all kinds of different churches. Every town had dozens of churches of many different kinds. Um, it's a Protestant area. And historically, it's been a Protestant area. And so as a result, uh, there have just been lots of different types of churches in every town. And it's part of the it's it's part of the atmosphere you grow up in. It's not surprising. It's just what you've always known. Yeah. So it's just kind of a, the, the regular, the, the nominal thing. Was it and then your search for kind of a, tr a, a, a true church? That makes sense. I don't think a lot of people begin searching like that. Like I just found a denomination because cause I, I knew friends that went there and, and began going to that church. Did people think that was a bit odd that you were maybe encountering, that you were looking for this? I mean, I, I picture you going you going to a church and, and, and somebody asking you, oh, are you here to visit? And you'd say, well, I'm looking for the true church. Would they kind of give you a strange look in, in that in that? Well, I, I, at that point, I wouldn't have said I'm looking for the true church because mm -hmm. I didn't know that there would be such a thing as a uniquely true church. Um, what I was looking for was the most accurate presentation of God's word that I could find. And and that didn't mean that there was going to be one that he had providentially guided the right. way I would say he has guided the Catholic Church. It could be that, okay, the Methodists are right about this bit, but they're wrong about this other thing. Meanwhile, the Presbyterians are right about this bit, but they're wrong about this other thing. It might have been that there's no one church that has a consistently accurate understanding of God's Word but I was looking for the most accurate presentation of it I could find. And, and so, and of course, I'm not going to go into a, um, a church environment and start meeting people socially and start interrogating them. Um, I, you know, I was kind of doing, doing the reading on my own. And then if, as I gain confidence and okay, I should check out this body and I should, I'll go there and, and, and see what's happening there and what they're teaching. And, um, and I be just because of my nature, I'm going to tend to gravitate, especially at this phase in my career, I would tend to gravitate to the more theologically alert and interested members of a congregation. So I would, you know, that, like when I started going to the Presbyterian church, well, the fir among the first people I met were the elders and also other, th even people who were not elders, but were theologically interested and in invested in studying theology. And Presbyterianism itself tends to be, at least in its conservative forms, it tends to be a more intellectually engaged um, tradition. Uh, it's more based on intellectual experience than, say, emotional experience that you might find in some congregations. And um, so I would hang out with kind of the theology crowd. And in fact, one of my best friends at the time was the youth minister at the, uh, the Presbyterian church. He was a guy named Mike Biggs. He was about my age, and he was really theologically sharp. And he and I would um, get together just on our own and argue theology with each other, just just for just for our own entertainment and edification, because you know they, it, there's the saying in 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 Proverbs, "Iron sharpens iron." Yeah. And he and I would sharpen our theology skills on each other, and and we would uh, debate theological issues with each other, and it was a lot of fun, and it was very enlightening, and we would as we would refine the discussion and the arguments, we would arrive at, at various truths. And, uh, and also I would win. And so that was, that was rewarding. Now you mentioned that, that, that there aren't a lot of Catholic churches or Catholics uh, where you grew up. What was your, did you have a view of the Catholic church at that point? And I wonder when you began investigating the denominations, was the Catholic church a denomination within that spectrum or were they kind of uniquely different you at that well, point. as a kid, I really didn't understand Catholics. Um, I knew very few of them. Uh, the only real memory I have about Catholics, uh, as like when I was in grade school and junior high and stuff like that, is um, they were the ones who would like leave school on certain days of the year to go to church. 
Um, and in hindsight, okay, this is like Holy Week. That's what they were doing. They were going on like Holy Thursday and Good Friday, and they were participating in ceremonies at the Catholic Church. They were, I, you know, I had I knew that they like would kiss the cross and things like that. And but that's really about all I knew. I mean, I knew there was such a thing as Catholics, but I really did not understand them very well. Um, and I, I also kind of knew that it tended to go kind of ethnically. So like the Italian kids are tend to be Catholic and stuff like that. Um, but not much more than that. After I became a committed evangelical, it was a different matter. Uh, one of the things about the crazy Gene Scott guy is he, 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 he was kind of sort of, you know, anti-Catholic <laughs> and, um, and he had been influenced by, uh, the 19th century, actually Anglican, um, author Alexander Hislop, who wrote a yeah. book called The Two Babylons, in which he argued that Catholicism is really um, ancient Babylonian paganism in a Christian guise. And so there was a real live question in my mind, are Catholics even Christians? And that was not something that was clear to me. And I kind of went back and forth on that about whether Catholics would actually be Christians. Now, of course, if they believe the gospel, they would be. But there's, but is that actually what's being taught in their church? And from the perspective of many traditional historical Protestants, the answer would be no. And so, uh, so I was exposed to that, and I did recognize that Catholics, you know, were different than. Protestants in a significant respect. I later learned about, oh, wait, there's these Orthodox people too. Yeah. And I'm reading their books. And and so I'm learning about them and Catholics, and I'm getting a broader appreciation of uh, the scope of historic Christianity. One thing I didn't mention uh, that also played a role here was um, one of the things that was really stressed in the uh, evangelical circles that I, I, I was part of was figuring out what the original audience believed and what did the early Christians believe? You know, that was the, like, that's what we should emulate is what the early Christians believed. And eventually it's like, well, you know, the New Testament isn't the only set of early Christian documents we have. Maybe I should read some of the other early Christian documents we have. And so I got this book. It was the Penguin Edition. is edited by a guy named Maxwell Staniforth. It was called Early Christian Writings. And basically, it was an edition of some, not all, but some of the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, so this is documents from the first century and kind of the first half of the second century. And I read them, and they didn't sound evangelical. <laughs> they sounded kind of Catholic. And I mean, it wasn't exactly modern Catholicism. It was kind of like sort of Catholic and sort of fundamentalist. It's kind of like a mix of these two things. Um, but that helped open my eyes again to other ways of looking at Scripture in a way that was kind of more open to a Catholic interpretation because it's right there in the early fathers on a variety of issues. Yeah. So you, you said Matthew 16 was the thing that really began to open your 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 eyes to looking at the at scriptures through, through a Catholic lens, and I think that the Church Fathers would the Apostolic Fathers would do that as well. Certainly, and you mentioned these structures in Matthew sixteen, so I, I'd be curious to know: is yeah. that something that you can elaborate on? Is that something that you you saw and maybe wouldn't necessarily say was really compelling anymore because maybe it's, maybe you've learned more since then? Is is this something that you still think is a really compelling? Oh, no, absolutely. This has not changed. These are, <laughs> I, I don't know why more Catholic apologists don't use them because these are, to my mind, totally compelling. Um, in fact, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I, 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 I am respectful of work that m many Catholics are doing apologetically, I think sometimes they, I think sometimes, I mean, there's always room for growth and, and constructive criticism. And I think that sometimes the arguments that Catholics use in this area could be improved. Um, now, one of the first things, and I have seen an improvement on this point in the last 30 years. Um, so the, the basic argument that is commonly made in Protestant circles, or now I should say, there's not a single view 
of Matthew 16 in Protestant circles, because there's not a single view of anything in Protestant circles. Even sola scriptura and sola fide are understood different ways by different groups of Protestants. But, so there are Protestants who will say, yeah, Peter's the rock. You know, there are lots of Protestant scholars who will acknowledge that. Um, F.F. Bruce, a Baptist, British Baptist scholar, for example, is perfectly happy to acknowledge that, and he's just one of many. But of those in the Protestant community who reject the idea that Peter's the rock, the, the key point that they will rely on is in the Greek, um, when Jesus is talking to Peter, he says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the word in Greek that he uses for Peter is petros, uh, P-E-T-R-O-S, to use the English alphabet. And then the word he uses for on this rock, the word for rock there is petra, P-E-T-R-A, to use the uh, English alphabet. And they will say, okay, we've got a difference in these two words. And uh, Petros meant small stone, whereas maybe, you know, like pebble or something, whereas Petra means large rock, like boulder or cliff face or something like that. And therefore, what's happening in this passage is Jesus is using what's if you want to use a fancy term for it, is called antithetic parallelism. He's put Peter in parallel with the rock, but it's an antithetic parallelism where he's contrasting them. It's like, look how small you are, Peter, compared to this great big other thing I'm going to build my church on. Okay, so that's the standard presentation. Now, Catholics typically will respond to this, uh, apologists will frequently respond to this, with... um, a number of points. One of them is that, okay, they probably weren't speaking in Greek here. They were probably speaking in Aramaic. And this distinction is probably an artifact of the Greek. In Aramaic, the word that probably would have been used in both cases was kepha, which is which is where we get Peter's name, Cephas. It's a a Greek form of the Aramaic word kepha, which means rock. And it probably in Aramaic was the same word in both cases. And okay, that's true. And many Protestant scholars are happy to acknowledge that. However, there's a counter argument that I don't see Protestant authors making very often. At least I can't think of any who've done this, but it's what I would do if I was a Protestant scholar or a Protestant apologist. And and I, I think it would catch a lot of Catholic apologists flat-footed to hear a Protestant apologist say this. But okay, yeah, so maybe it was uh, kepha in both cases in Greek. But the inspired text of Matthew in front of us is in Greek, and the inspired text of Matthew in front of us has two different words here. And so even if it was one word in Aramaic, when the inspired Matthew puts it into Greek, that may indicate the Holy Spirit is drawing out a clarifying uh, qualification here. And so the Holy Spirit may be via the medium of Greek, clarifying Jesus's meaning to make it more intelligible to a Greek-speaking audience. And so you, Mr. Catholic Apologist, can't rely simply on what was in the Aramaic here, because it's the Greek that's inspired. And I don't, I, I don't know how most Catholic apologists would respond to that. <laughs> um, I know how I would respond to that. I would say, well, that's a very interesting possibility, but it's not the only one, because number one, If you dig into the linguistics on this, it turns out this small stone, large rock distinction was found in some early Greek poetry, centuries before the time of Christ. But if you go to Protestant uh, dictionaries of Greek, they will, and, and commentators, they will acknowledge that this distinction was gone by the first century. Uh, In first century Koine Greek, uh, these words were synonymous. They didn't have an established difference in meaning. And so you can't rely on on that to show there's a difference. Now, maybe there still is. Maybe there still is a difference between Petra and Petros in this passage. But it's not the words only that tell you that. You have to do more work with the text. So... um, so what else uh, could be going on here? 
Well, you you noticed I mentioned, and I ha- always hate to introduce fancy words when they're not needed. So earlier I mentioned antithetic parallelism. <clears throat> the reason I gave that term was because there's another kind of parallelism we need to know about. Synthetic parallelism. Synthetic parallelism occurs, it's a literary form of speech where you have two things, they're in parallel with each other, and they build on each other. So you have the initial introduction of one thing, and then you build on it with something that's in parallel with it, but that is modified. And so even if you want to say Petros means little stone and Petra is meaning large rock, guess what? Doesn't have to be antithetic parallelism, could be synthetic, in which case Jesus is saying, Peter, you may look like a little rock, but on the great big rock that you really are, I'm going to build my church. So even if you grant that these might mean different things, um, they uh, they don't require Peter to be different than the rock. So this is another live possibility. Now, another question that, uh, that Protestants who are uh, probing a Catholic on this passage will frequently do is they will say, well, then if it's, why didn't he, why didn't he use the same word both times if it's Peter? And I will hear Catholics say things like, well, he wouldn't have used Petros both times because uh, he, he wouldn't have used Petra both times because Petra is feminine. It, it's feminine gender in Greek, whereas Petros is masculine. And it would be insulting to Peter to call him Petra. So, of course, he's going to use, you are Peter Petros. He's going to use the masculine form when he directly addresses Peter. Yeah, okay, fine. So what? That's not the issue. Why didn't he use Petros both times? Why didn't he use the masculine form both times? He could have said, you are Petros, and on this Petros, I will build my church. And I, I, I almost never hear Catholic apologists addressing that. <laughs> now, how I would address it is, number one, could be that even though the words don't require a difference in meaning between Petros and Petra, maybe there is, and maybe this is synthetic parallelism. Maybe that's why he changed. Maybe Jesus wanted to make the point, you seem like a smaller stone, but you're, you're more than you think you are, and I'm going to build a church on you. Or maybe it's simply to avoid repetition. Different languages have different tolerances for repetition. English does not like repetition. Hebrew loves it. In Hebrew, you know, you're, you're reading about the construction of the Tower of Babel, and it's like, let us brick with bricks, you know, and like, okay, we would not never say that in English. <laughs> you know, let's build with bricks, because we don't like repeating the same word too often in close proximity. So, um, so maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe Jesus is just varying it stylistically, or Matthew is varying it stylistically to avoid too close a repetition of the same word in Greek. So that's a possibility. But here we have a bunch of possibilities. How can we sort them out? That's where the structures come in. (laughs) Because if you look at the structure of this passage, Jesus makes three basic statements to Peter. Now, of course, the setup for the passage, as I'm sure your listeners will be aware, is um, Jesus has said, who do people say that I am? And they propose a bunch of things. Some people think this, some people think that. And Jesus says, okay, so who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in reply to that, Jesus makes three statements. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. This is statement one. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. Statement number two, you are, I say to you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. Statement number three, Behold, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we've got these three statements. Now, statement number one, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Is that something that sounds like a blessing? What do you think? (laughs) Um telling him a name. He's giving him a name. No, 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 no. Forget names. We're looking at the statements. Blessed are you. Is that a blessing or a put down? That's a blessing. Yeah, that's a blessing. Okay. Let's look at the third beginning of the third statement. (laughs) I give you the keys to the kingdom. Blessing or put down? That sounds like a blessing. 
Blessing, right. Okay, yeah. so yeah. that gives us the context for that middle statement, you are Peter. Now, on the antithetic parallelism view, that's a put down. You're this little small stone that's insignificant in contrast to the great big rock I'm going to build my church on. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't scan to have a blessing followed by a put down followed by a blessing. The context for that middle statement tells us it's a blessing because yeah. we got a blessing before it and a blessing after it. And so that means that you are Peter is not a put down. It is itself a blessing. And that points us in the direction of Peter being the rock. Whether you buy the amplification argument or not, he's the rock and because Jesus is not putting him down in this passage. Yeah. Then there, if you notice, each one of these three statements, it itself has three parts. And it's kind of like a little grid. Um, we've covered the first part, but there are two more parts to each one of these statements. So in the first statement, the initial statement is, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Then the second part is, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And the third part is, but my Father in heaven. In the middle statement, we also have three parts. The first part is, uh, uh, you, are, uh, you are Peter. The second part is, on, my, on this rock I will build my church. And the third part is, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In the third statement, the first part is, I give you the keys to the kingdom. The second part is, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And the third part is, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we have a nice three-part, three statements with three parts each. Now, we've covered the implications of what the first part says about Peter. Maybe we can learn something from looking at the other two parts. So in the first statement, the beginning initial thing, the initial thought is, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And that's continued with, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Okay, that tells us why Peter is blessed. He didn't figure this out on his own. God revealed it to him. That's what it means for Peter to be blessed in this case, because he was the recipient of divine revelation. In the third statement, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, that's continued with whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's part of what it means to have the keys. They give you the authority to bind and loose. So we see that in the first statement, the meaning of the initial statement is unpacked in the second two parts. And in the third statement, the meaning of the initial part is unpacked in the second two parts. And therefore, in that middle statement, the meaning of the first part, you are Peter, is going to be unpacked by the second two parts, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so that tells us what the meaning of you are Peter is. You are the one on which I'm going to build this unstoppable, undying church. <laughs> and you don't need to go to the Greek to see any of that. It's all right there in the English if you're just sensitive to literary form and structure. <laughs> That's fabulous. And I can see, I can see to me why recognizing that in Matthew 16 would would give you pause and say, well, Catholics have something going on here. If this, cause mm -hmm. that's quite compelling. Listen, I've, I've heard it said before by, by very intelligent people looking into the Catholic church that really the papacy is kind of where it hangs. Right. And if you can come to the conclusion that what's happening in Matthew For 16 many is kind of, yeah, it's kind of, as you say, right. If, if Catholics get the Pope, right. Then that's the seat of the authority that they mm -hmm. claim to have. Then everything else kind of, falls in line from there, right? If you get the head of the church right, if that's the where authority Christ issue. founded the church. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was was that kind of your kind of, where you kind of started to become convinced of the Catholic Church? I mean, you said that Matthew 16 was very important for you. Did things kind of fall in line for you from there? Or, and if not, I wonder how you would speak to somebody who is approaching there. Because it seems to me that, that that's a very cogent argument. If you get the, the head of the church right, if you see that that what's happening in Matthew 16 is that Christ is founding a church on Peter, mm -hmm. you really have to begin to be open to whatever else the Catholic church is teaching, 
Is that fair yeah, to say? and and that's what happened with me. I said if they're right about this, then I have to look at everything with an open mind. Now, there's more. I I know you didn't want to go for too long tonight, but I know there's <laughs> oh, there's there's more that you can get out of this passage than what I've done. A number of years ago, I did a um, I was invited to uh, a, a actually a, a Protestant. Uh, school to give a talk to a class they were teaching on Catholicism. And um, I was asked to present a Catholic case for the Catholic Church. And so I wrote a I wrote a talk, which is on my website, jimmyakin.com, called Why Be Catholic, an Exercise for Evangelicals. And maybe you can put a link to that in the show notes or something. But um, I go through what I just covered, but I also go through more. And, um, and there, so there's more to be gotten from some of these passages. Jesus only talks about his church using the term church in two passages, Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. And there's a significant amount you can deduce based on those passages that points in the direction of the Catholic Church. Now, in my case, as I indicated, merely seeing that Catholics are right about Peter being the rock and that he could then be described as the leader of the earthly church in Jesus's absence. Okay, that coheres with Catholic claims, but it doesn't prove all of them. Um, I needed to go further and investigate other issues. What frequently happens now, I've seen it happen for people where they they get the authority issue and it clicks and they don't have a and, and that everything immediately falls in place for them. Um, in my case, it wasn't like that because the way people's you know people approach the christian faith and its fullness the catholic faith they approach it differently if they're having an intellectual conversion and you may need to see and this is what happened with me you may need to see the catholic church being right on enough issues that it gives you the confidence to let go and just trust the church on the remaining issues and, and that's what needed to happen for me. Um, I needed to satisfy myself, not just that it was right about Peter being the rock and so forth, but that, that it was right on a whole range of issues. And, and, and in a way, accepting the Catholic view of authority, of scripture, tradition, and magisterium, in a way, that was sort of the, the final thing that fell into place for me. Because in order to fully embrace the Catholic view of authority, I needed to see that it was right on enough specific issues to say, okay, this methodology is is over is reliable in an overall way. Um, and it's kind of interesting because early on, I mean, I saw cracks in sola scriptura, um, the idea that we need to get our yeah. doctrine and practice from the Bible only, that we need to be able to prove them all from the Bible only. I, I remember going to, uh, you know, some of my theological friends in the evangelical world and saying, so how can we prove that from Scripture alone? How can we prove sola scriptura from Scripture alone? And sometimes they would name a passage, uh, and it would never it would never work. You know, the if you go through the passages that are uh, proposed for sola scriptura, they don't work. And and one uh, guy I was talking to was honest enough to say, well, really, sola scriptura is more our assumption. It's our starting point. It's our axiom rather than something we can actually prove. But that's problematic because if you can't prove it, it doesn't meet its own test. Um, and it ends up being self-refuting. But I had so imbibed the idea in the evangelical community that we need to prove everything from Scripture alone, that I needed to see the Catholic Church proved right by Scripture often enough to say, okay, this this I can trust this church, this overall methodology of Scripture plus tradition uh, plus the as interpreted by the magisterium, that is reliable. And in fact, subsequently to that, um, I, I've that I've come to more deeply realize that's the methodology that was in use in the first century. I, I talk about that in my book, The Bible is a Catholic Book, um, where I, I instead of, well, sort of, sort of the approach I give in the book is starting at the beginning 
really of human history, yeah. but then walking through the different stages as God gave his word. And I talk about how it was received and the role tradition played in each stage and how the magisterium enters the picture. And, and, and I, by taking this historical approach, I show that actually tradition is the primordial form of the authoritative word of God. Scripture is a later it, uh, is a later development in the history of God's plan, and uh, the first century Christians were using the scripture, tradition, and magisterium paradigm that Catholics still use today. And the idea of using scripture alone is a much later intellectual development that could only have happened after the development of the printing press. Because Prior to the 1400s, you could not manufacture enough copies of Scripture to allow every person to read Scripture for himself and and decide what it means. Yeah, that not, that alone is is quite the revelation to to come to, right? As a Protestant Christian, I was backed into that in my own journey mm-hmm. because I was in the church trying to figure out different issues from the Bible alone. We were non-denominational church, so we had no kind of domination mm-hmm. to fall back on, and we got to a place where we're a bunch of of people, this kind of steering committee and different people in leadership in the church with our Bibles and theologians that we liked trying to figure out our position on different things. And I, I kind of went, this is how we do it? Isn't, isn't there a better way? Like we're just all pitting the same verses against each other and coming to different conclusions. We're all praying really hard and trying really hard, Jimmy, in our interpretations and, and, and we're at odds. And mm-hmm. that's how I kind of backed into looking at, well, where, how else do other Christians, how did the early church solve these disputes? Mm-hmm. I encounter things like is it I think it's Matthew 18 where Christ talks about the structure of the church and how to yeah. solve how to solve disputes and I went wait a minute I mean I brought that to my senior pastor and said wait how do we apply this because if you and I disagree on this bible inter- b- biblical interpretation I can just leave this church and go to a different church and I'm still part of the church but Christ sets them out of the church if we disagree how do we like, mm-hmm. right, that became a problem for, for me and backed me into looking where else is there or how else is this interpreted in other places in the Christian sphere, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, was that one of the verses that, that you'd encounter and say, well, here's Christ talking about a church and this? Well, yeah, as I, like a, a as I mentioned, right? yeah, as I mentioned, there are the two passages in the Gospels where Christ talks about his church using the term church. One is Matthew 16, one is Matthew 18, and the fact that the church is visible and has a visible membership is one of the things that can be derived from these passages. And I talk about that in uh, in that paper I mentioned, Why Be Catholic and Exercise for Evangelicals. Yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes for sure. I want to, I want to, ask you one final question here. We could talk mm-hmm. forever on this because there's so much to unpack in this and I love it. And thank you for being here, Jimmy. Oh, I my appreciate pleasure. your time and, and listeners and viewers will, I'm sure, love this this conversation. For me, I can recall distinctly sitting in front of my computer. This is, this is 2013, 2014, when I thought seriously about becoming Catholic and I Google was around at this point, thankfully. Mm-hmm. And I Googled Protestants becoming Catholic, thinking that nobody ever did this because I hadn't heard of, right? I've heard of lots of Protestants uh, who were former Catholics. My church was filled with them at this time. It's non-denominational church, but I hadn't heard of Protestants becoming Catholic. When, when you were looking into this, mm-hmm. I, was that a thing in your mind? Did you think, do people ever even do this? Is this a thing that, that happens? Well, I was, um, I was sort of part of, I, when I was becoming Catholic, there was sort of a wave of, yeah. of, of American uh, evangelical to Catholic conversions going on. Um, so it, kind of one of the first was Thomas Howard. And uh, he was, uh, for people who may not be familiar, uh, Thomas Howard was an evangelical author and professor who ended up becoming Catholic. Um, Scott Hahn had become Catholic a few, just a, a, I, I'm not sure of the exact year, but just a few years before I did, I became Catholic. Other people, uh, and, and not just uh, people from evangelicalism, but people from the conservative Presbyterian world were in the process of becoming Catholic. And so it was kind of a thing. Uh, I, it was not, I wasn't really aware 
of it prior to my own discovery regarding Matthew 16. But after that discovery, as soon as I started investigating further, I found, oh, there are these other people who are doing the same thing or have been doing the same thing. Yeah. I, I think one thing that you mentioned too is so fascinating is it's, it's from a rigorous intellectual tradition. I mean, you mm -hmm. worked very hard to investigate Christianity to begin with, then investigate Catholicism. And so did these other people like Thomas Howard, Scott Hahn, mm -hmm. these other converts came, Scott Hahn in particular, they came from a very Calvinist background, very rigorous theological background. It's not as if any of you fell into the Catholic Church. This was based on some serious study, work of the Holy Spirit, obviously, but mm -hmm. really a, a rigorous intellectual <laughs> investigation, right? Yeah. Incidentally, I got to know uh, Scott Hahn when I was in the process of uh, converting, and he was a big help to me at the time. I really owe him a debt of gratitude. I especially am grateful to him because, and this was another one of the providential coincidences I mentioned but didn't go into, um, on the morning that Renee died, I, I it was clear that she was going to be dying very shortly, and I called up Scott and I said, um, you know, Renee is about to die and he was on his way to Eucharistic adoration and I asked him to pray for her. And so he was actually praying for Renee in front of uh, the Eucharist, in front of Jesus as she was dying. And so I've always been very grateful to him for that. <laughs> that's, ex that's extraordinary. And I, I think too, Jimmy, it's, it's a, that's a difficult story obviously to tell it's a, a matter how many years pass, of course. Right. But as you say, the Providence that kind of has marked your journey is amazing because I mean, the work you do now, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Catholic in part through the work that you've done at Catholic mm -hmm. answers. I used to jog by the river, listening to Catholic answers podcast mm -hmm. in my headphones, learning about the Catholic faith from people like you, Jimmy. And I just think of the ripples that have been caused and the people that have been brought into the church and the faith and, and deepened in their faith thanks to this, the providence at work in your life and you responding to these calls uh, all along. Uh, so, so thank you. Well, it's, it's been my honor to, uh, to serve and to be able to play a role uh, that helps people. It, it, I'm very blessed to be able to uh, lead a life uh, where I, I get to do what it's like my nature calls me to do, which is to, to, you know, study God's word and to communicate it to others. Um, as, as soon as I had my initial conversion to Christ at age 20, I realized this is what I really, this is the calling of my heart. And it, I'm yeah. so blessed to be able to be able to do those things and to play a role and help others. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for embracing your calling, Jimmy. What, where do you want to point uh, listeners, viewers to if they haven't listened, don't listen to your podcast, uh, shame on them because <laughs> it's a fabulous podcast. Uh, where do you want them to go to find, to find and follow you, Jimmy? Well, so I, I, I work for Catholic Answers and our website is catholic.com because we thought ahead. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so, you know, check out catholic.com. They can check out, uh, my activity online in particular at jimmyakin.com. Uh, you got to spell my name right to get there. J-I-M-M-Y-A-K-I-N. Just four letters. A-K-I-N as in Nancy. No S, no T, no E. A-K-I-N. Just like it sounds. And so you can go to jimmyakin.com and I have uh, blog posts and, and uh, podcasts and all kinds of stuff there. Um, you can also, if you want to go, and I'm actually on uh, like multiple podcasts. I mean, I'm on Catholic Answers Live. I'm on Catholic Answers Focus. I'm on Secrets of Star Trek. I'm on Secrets of Doctor Who. The one I'm best known for, my personal podcasts, of course, is Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. And um, just type in Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. It'll come right up. Uh, and, and now, do you happen to know uh, when... The, I know we're pre-recording this. Do you know when it's going to go live? We're looking at the middle of June, Jimmy. Middle of June. Okay. Well, uh, by the middle of June, we will have just completed a couple of episodes on Mysterious World where I interview one of the government's former military psychic spies. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, and <laughs> so we'll be talking to him. And then we'll also, by uh, the second part of June, we're going to be talking about 
real life Haitian zombies. So check it out. That's, that's, if there were a better sell for that podcast, I don't know what, what it is, Jimmy. <laughs> and of course, your books are fabulous. And you've been on this podcast before as well. So I'll put those, uh, those links in the show notes as well. Uh, Jimmy, as always, thank you so much for being here. Uh, God bless you and the fantastic work you are doing for the church. And really, truly, thank you so much for telling the story and being here. Thank you so much. And God bless you and all of your listeners. Thank you.